Hello, dear friends. May God bless you all, all of you. And I hope that this meditation of ours here will clarify and eradicate doubt and help you understand who God is, to understand Him, to have the sensitivity to hear His voice, His word, because His word, His voice is powerful. It is powerful, but it's not powerful like an atomic bomb. It is powerful to the point of transforming your life, the old life of yours, into a new one, a brand new one, new. So God's voice is capable of doing that in your life. You know, I was questioning, asking God, my God, why are there so many people who have believed in you? There are so many people in the church, at least in the universal church. We see many people throughout this world professing their Christian faith, living their Christian faith, and yet this faith has not been materialized in their life as, as it should, because everything came into existence through the Word of God. What didn't exist came into existence only because of the Word of God. His voice is powerful to the point of dividing the flames of fire. Can you imagine that? Imagine what the voice of God is capable of doing in your life. Bring this to your personal life, to your personal life. Don't look at others. Don't question or asking or supervising other people's life. Look at your own life. But before looking at your own life, look at the Word of God. Meditate on it. Drink of it. Absorb its spirit. And you will have a new life. But as I was saying, I was asking, my God, why are there so many people in the church? So many people come. We've been praying, asking, crying out, advising, preaching the Word and so on. Every single day, from Monday to Monday, from January to January, in every situation, whatever are the circumstances, we've been preaching this word. But the result, the outcome has been, I'd say, apparently insignificant before what he has promised. Look at Israel, for example, God's chosen people, the children in flesh, the descendants of Abraham. They are there at war, surrounded by their enemies. My God, why this? Why that? This tiny questions that we ask God about. And the life of these people that have believed in you, Lord, in your word, why aren't there results as sometimes we expect? 
And Jesus answers. Jesus answers. Jesus answered me. He says clearly this word here. He said like this. This people honors me with their lips. This people worships me with their lips. This people professes my name with their lips. This people repeat my word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But they lack everything because it's only with their lips. These people makes the physical sacrifice to put an offering on the altar. However, their heart is far from me. And here's the reason why. This is the problem. This is the problem of the vast majority of those who consider themselves Christians. Oh, my dear friend, you who consider yourself a Christian and you don't see your dreams being fulfilled in Christ Jesus, here is the answer. And it's not God's fault. It's not the church's fault. It's not the pastor's fault, the bishop's fault. It's not the husband's or the wife's fault, the children's, the parents' fault. No, it's our own fault. That's it. It's our own fault. This is the reality. Because it's easy to weave our lips, even to sing to God, to worship Him, to profess His name, to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. However, the heart, which means your essence, the essence of your will and dreams of your personal projects, this essence is far from me. Far from me. It's here. These people honors me with their lips. Which means even offerings and tithes and vows in the vast majority of times it's only with their lips because on the inside the person is selfish, self-centered. They do not want to sacrifice their dreams for the dreams of God. They do not want to sacrifice their desires to do God's will. They do not want to sacrifice their heart to receive a new one. They don't. That's the reality. That is the pure reality. And that's why people suffer. Even though they are inside of churches, pastors, bishops, pastors' wives. I say this because I see this happening almost every day. People, colleagues of mine in the ministry that were once icons of faith. They were a reference in faith. But when you least expect, they are fallen, prostrated. They are diving into the mud of this world. Why? Why? My God, why is it? Because God, dear friends, knows our heart. He knows the intentions of our soul. He knows what our ambitions are, 
what our projects are, our dreams, our lusts, and vain ways. He knows all things. So he says, listen, these people honor me with their lips, meaning physically they honor me. It's easy for you to, let's say, you received from God a thousand and then you take the first ten percent, which is the first fruit, and you place on the altar. This is easy because God gave you a thousand. You have a thousand available to you and you are going to be faithful or not, depending on what you want to do. God gives you the right, the privilege to decide, to choose, to opt. So it's easy for you to practice this. It's easy. You just have to stick your hand in the pocket, take it and put on the altar what belongs to God. But the difficult thing is to place the heart on the altar. It's easy to place an offering that is even a sacrifice on the altar. It's easy to take a thousand pounds that God has given you and place on the altar and be left with nothing, zero. Oh my God, here it is. Here's my sacrifice. But if there is no heart in it, then this sacrifice won't have any value. He will give back to you. Everything that we place on the altar, He will give back to us because everything comes from Him. Everything. Everything comes from His hands. Oh, Bishop, wait there. If I don't work, you know that I won't receive anything. Uh, my daily bread. Of course. But He gives you work. He gives you good health to work. He gives you air, the oxygen for you to work. He gives you life and, and a work for you to go to. He gives you everything. He provides to all of our needs, whether or not we believe in Him. He makes the sunshine for everyone, good and evil. He gives everything to everyone. However... He sees the heart of each person. He sees, he sees, he has a perfect radiography of our soul, of our heart. And he knows what our true intentions are of our offerings of our tithes. So, my dear friends, it's pointless for you to place the material on the altar. If the spiritual, you don't want to sacrifice. You do not want to sacrifice it. And then it's difficult. Let me share an experience with you. I've already said this many times before. This is a good example of what I'm talking about now because it's an experience that I had, a personal one. So when I was young, when I was young, I was a teenager and I was looking for a girlfriend, of course, someone that could be my partner and so on. And God, God, I didn't know him yet. I was not converted. I was just a young man, like any other. I was just like anybody else. But I was going to church, attending services, because I enjoyed hearing the word of God. And God showed me Esther. The first time I saw her, he said, look, she's the one. She will be your partner, your wife. This voice came inside of me. Out of the blue. I was not converted. 
I didn't know Jesus yet, but it was the first time that the Lord revealed himself to me. He showed me his will, but his will was contrary to my will, because in that moment I said no, I had a certain profile of a young lady that was different. And then I groaned. I was banging my head against a brick wall, you know. For as long as I didn't hear that voice and sacrificed my heart, my, let's say, the profile of the young lady I wanted and so on, as long as I didn't sacrifice my will, I suffered, and suffered, and suffered. Do you know how many years it took? Let me think here. We got married at the age of almost 27. So more or less 10 years. 10 years, give or take. Excuse me. because I didn't want to sacrifice my will. And this is the situation. People do not want to sacrifice their will. And where does our will come from, our personal will? It comes from the heart. From the heart. Jesus is saying this, exactly this. These people honors me with their lips. It's just physical and material. It's the offering, the tithe. It's the church attendance. It's the work, the evangelism they do, charity works, and, you know, the good deeds they do to help others. However, their heart is far from me. What does it mean to have a heart far from God? A heart that is far from God, it's a heart that is far from the altar. That's it. God wants our hearts on the altar. Of course, when you place the heart on the altar, everything is placed on it, the whole package. Because the heart is what decides what the person wants. It's the Lord of each of us. It's the heart. He gives the orders. He tells us to marry a person we shouldn't. He tells us to get a job or do a work that we wouldn't like to do. He tells us to choose the profession A, B, or C, D. It's the wicked heart that is deceiving, corrupt, cruel. This heart is what God wants, the center of our will. And when we place the heart on the altar, it means that we are placing our will subject to God's will. It means that we are placing our heart upon or under the rules of the king of the kingdom of God. My dear friends, think about this. Meditate on these words. It's pointless for you to place all of your money, your properties, your wealth on the altar. If your heart is not on the altar, God will not accept it. God does not accept it. He does not accept. I know that you may have faith to place offerings upon offerings and sacrifices, but if those don't come with your heart, then it's pointless. And I say the heart, referring to your will, referring to your wills, the Lordship of your heart, and you turn your heart into a servant of God and not a servant of yourself. Yourself. 
The answer is here for every Christian that is being failing, that is cold in their faith, who want to receive the Holy Spirit, but they haven't been able to. When a person is baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's because God found the offering that he was looking for, which was their heart. The person placed their heart, then the Holy Spirit came to occupy and to reign over that heart. Do you understand, my dear friends? Do you understand the root of the problem that you face? Your problem is not your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your parents, your work, lack of money, your mediocre life, and miserable. No, your problem, the problem of mankind is their own heart. As long as the heart is reigning over our lives, we will be bound to fail and to live in misery and disgrace a miserable life, which is what we are seeing inside of the churches, amongst pastors as well. I've seen colleagues of mine who are, come on, full of faith, fallen, prostrated. Why? Because they prioritized the fruit of the lips, worship, adoration, including the strange tongues. But it's strange indeed. It's strange even to God. However, strange tongues still. My dear friends, Jesus said with few words, but powerful, he said, these people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And he complements this. And in vain, look at this, in vain, meaning it's useless, in vain, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Therefore, dear friends, if you want to participate in the campaign of Israel, which the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God promotes twice a year, if you want to fulfill a dream, the greatest dream, actually, this is God's dream. Did you know this? Did you know that God's dream is you? Did you know that you are in God's plan, that He dreams of dwelling inside of you, of abiding within you? Did you know that the glory of the latter temple is exactly this, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the glory of the latter temple. This glory is God's dream. He wants to place this inside of you, leading you, guiding your heart. Because when you place your heart on the altar, you no longer give offerings, but you become the offering. Did you understand? You've been giving offerings and offerings and sacrifices, but when you place the heart, which is what God wants to dwell in, He wants to abide in your heart. He wants to descend with His glory to dwell inside this heart. Then you stop giving offerings to become the living offering on God's altar, wherever you go, then it's not just when you go to church anymore or when you come here to the temple. No. You are a living offering in your house. You are God's living offering in your house, amongst your family members, in your workplace, at school, in the streets. Your behavior sanctifies God's name wherever you go. His name is sanctified in your life 
when you become this offering, this living offering, did you understand, dear friends? God is a spirit, and you know that, don't you? Don't you know that God is a spirit? Very well. The spirit of God is looking for heart to dwell in and then exude the fragrance of our Lord Jesus Christ wherever this heart goes. So this heart becomes the offering itself, the altar of God itself. Ah, how wonderful. Remember that Jesus said, when you bring your offering to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering by the altar. Don't give it. Go back there first and reconcile with your brother. And then you can go back and present your offering on the altar because God does not accept an offering that smells like resentments and grudges, that smells like wicked intentions. No, this, this offering stinks. It stinks. God does not accept it. He accepts the offering which is pure, which is sincere, transparent. The offering that he can dwell in, the offering that he can descend and dwell in, which is the heart. That's what happened to the first temple the first temple that Solomon built to God. But afterwards, God left that place because people fell into sin and that temple was destroyed and carried by the enemies there to Babylon. So Jesus came into this world to rebuild a new temple a new house, a new heart, so that then he can dwell in. Do you understand this? That's why many people, poor them, have been in the church for years and years, 20, 30, 40 years and their life won't change, and it will not change as long as they refuse to sacrifice their heart, as long as they refuse to sacrifice their will, their lusts, their desires, their pleasures, their sins, everything. Place your heart on the altar. Be the offering itself, a living offering, living stones, a living stone. We will speak about this another time. But know this. God is not looking at what you are placing on the altar. But he is looking at what motivated you to present that offering on the altar. Whether it's a heart that is seeking its own interests and is selfish but it's placing a big amount, a huge sacrifice there because you have that strong desire to prove to others that you are of God. You know, I'm of God. Look, look at my offering. Look at this. This is a rotten offering. God wants the heart on the altar. Because when you place your heart on the altar, Jesus said that it's the altar that sanctifies 
the gift. Have you read this before? It's not the gift that sanctifies the altar. It's not the tithe that sanctifies the altar. It's the temple that sanctifies the gift. It's the altar that sanctifies the gift, the tithe. But if the tithe and offerings, even if they are sacrificial, if they are not with a heart that is surrendered, dedicated, given, then the altar does not sanctify it and the person remains in the church for years, even before the altar, but nothing happens. God is seeing them, but God is saying, you see, these people, they honor me with their lips. They honor me with offerings and tithe and sacrifices, but their heart is far from me. And that's it. It's all pointless. It's all pointless. If your heart is full of grudges and resentment and a desire to seek revenge, then do not take part of the campaign of Israel because it won't resolve your problems. You place your offering. God will give it back to you. He won't be owing you anything. But nothing will happen in your life. You will be left out in the cold. Don't do that. If you do anything for God, then do it with all of your heart. It's a hundred percent. Place all of your soul. All of your soul. Be sincere. Sincere. Transparent. Because if it's not this way, the altar will not sanctify your offering and you will be left out in the cold. Did you understand, my dear friends? We will start the fast of Daniel on the 11th. Today is the 1st of July. In exactly 10 days, on the 11th, we shall begin the fast of Daniel. If you do the fast of Daniel with your heart inclined to yourself, trying to fulfill the whims of your vain ways and desires and your lusts, then don't even bother taking part in it because nothing will happen. God wants to descend upon your heart even though your heart is full of sins, no problem. But if you give it on the altar, then he comes upon it. And he changes this heart. He gives you a new heart. He will not allow you to keep the old one. He will not dwell in the old one either. He will give you a new one first, and then his glory will descend upon this heart and turn you into a living witness of his power here in this world and turn you into a living offering here in this world and turn you into someone that sanctifies his name here on earth. How wonderful. This is too great. If you got this spirit, if you caught this spirit and you obey it, you will break through. If not, you will continue the same. Anyway, Wednesday, this Wednesday now, after tomorrow, at 8 p.m. here in the Temple of Solomon, I will be speaking more about this. And if you are not interested, if you're not interested in sacrificing your heart and your will, don't you even come. Don't you even come waste your time. Come willing, ready, saying, I want, I'm tired of being myself, and I want a new life. A new life is a new soul, it's a new heart, but this only happens when you give the old one. This Wednesday at 8 p.m., here in the Temple of Solomon, may God bless you all, 
and I see you tomorrow in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.